It's Ian and Mark in the studio tonight. And Mark, you invited our guest, who is a former guest of the show. We've had him on, I think, live from the Liberty Forum, if I'm remembering correctly. The New Hampshire Liberty Forum, which is actually coming up again in February. We'll tell you more about that uh, here in a little bit. It's Tom Mullen. Can you do a quick intro? For yeah, Tom? Tom's a, an author, and he wrote me in a quick email uh, saying that he's been doing some research for a book that he's uh, got coming out. And I'm interested in the topic. Um, what he's been doing is looking at the historical roots of conservatism, liberalism, and libertarianism. Oftentimes we're told that libertarianism is its a subset of uh, conservatism. And Tom False. says, yeah, not so. So, Tom? Welcome back. Defend that thesis. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, guys, for having me on. Um, yeah, the book is actually out. It's called Where Do Conservatives and Liberals Come From? And Whatever Happened to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness? And uh, what I do in the, in the book is to take, you know, 134 words out of the Declaration of Independence that everybody, conservative, liberal, independent, libertarian, whomever, say that they agree with, which is, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that we are all created equal, endowed by our creator with inalienable rights, that the government is instituted to secure these rights. Uh, not all us libertarians actually believe that, but, you know, mainly 99% uh, of society says they do. And um, what I wanted to do is really look at the, the bright lights, the philosophers and the um, the movers and shakers in conservatism li and liberalism, and and see, do they actually say they agree with this or not? And, you know, I, I guess in, in the 21st uh, century, it's not very surprising that the uh, philosophical basis for liberalism is kind of antithetical to that idea. Um, when you look at a liberal, about... when you look at a liberal from the 18th or 19th century, early 19th century, you're not going to find somebody who, um, you know, thinks that uh, you know people should get uh, a living wage or necessarily that uh, somebody that uh, should get, um, you know. Uh, a, a minimum paycheck or, you know, welfare and these sorts of things that are very sort of progressive stuff these days. Yeah, and I, I think we have to define our terms because the word liberal now does not mean what it meant in the 19th century in America. Uh, now we call those people classical liberals, right? We feel we need a modifier because if we just call them liberals, uh, what they said and what, what liberals today say would, would be at odds with each other. Sure. So – where I go in the book with liberals, if you really want to understand the liberal mindset, even much more than Karl Marx, you have to read a guy named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And uh, what basically all of the philosophers that I looked at that are Enlightenment philosophers kind of started from the same place, what they call the state of nature, which is not so much some ancient time, but more the state we would be in if you took the government away. And there was nothing there. There was no government at all. What what would man be like? What would he be inclined to do? And for Rousseau, it's very simple. Um, everything was great. We were in kind of a Garden of Eden, a blissful state of ignorance until somebody said, this is mine. And I think he says and found people simple enough to believe him <laughs> that uh, once we had private property, then then all the trouble started. And what, uh, what occurs over time with people owning private property is these gross inequalities. And so for Rousseau, the purpose of the government is to correct the inequality that occurs with private property. And very interestingly, he uses the word alienation. He says what this requires is the total alienation of the individual together with all of his rights to the general will. Yeah, you'd have to do something like that. I'm trying to imagine a world where somebody said this is mine because I'm pretty sure from what I can tell, um, I'm you know, I've seen some farm animals before. I'm going to assume they're lower beasts than we are, and they're all about mine. They said mine far before uh, a man came along, uh, certainly a yeah. what we'd call a homo, homo sapien today. Um, I mean, you know, like a dog with a bone or the pigs at the trough or something like right. that. I'm, I'm thinking of my, uh, snake hole. <laughs> right. my 550 pound sow Hazel believes that uh, she gets should get to eat first and then everybody else can eat after she's full. And yeah, she's all about mine. 
Yeah, I mean, it, pro that's that's one of the, the great co conflicts here. But, you know, what I wanted to ki kind of show is, and if you read the passages I share from this uh, this writer, thinker, and you go and read the books yourself, it's it's undeniable that his way of looking at the world is Hillary Clinton's, was Ted Kennedy's, was Woodrow Wilson's, et cetera. So the modern liberal is really a Rousseauian, and Rousseau himself says there are no unalienable rights. They've all got to be given away if you want to you know, accomplish the goals of a free society. So you can kind of scratch them off. And um, I think what's more interesting, to, I, I don't think many liberals would deny that. I've talked to them myself, and they say, look, we shouldn't be listening to the founding fathers, those slave owners. And even if they didn't have slaves, their ideas are 250 years old. Society has had to progress. So I don't think they're, they're too, they would have too much trouble with saying, hey, well, you're not consistent with the Declaration of Independence. I think the conservatives would. But unfortunately, when you read the conservatives, they're, I mean, the true conservatives, they, they don't agree either. They do not believe there are inalienable rights. They believe mm -hmm. that everything from nature is given up as well. Yeah, I don't see how you can uh, re really argue one way or the other what conservatives appear to be in this uh, in this country, and I'm sure they're different in other countries, is they appear to be sort of anti-immigration, um, pro-military, pro, pro um, and when I say military, I mean quasi-military organizations like the police and firefighters also. Um, so they're not anti-government. They're anti-government uh, without guns or hoses. Uh, they don't like the, uh, the the bureaucrats, those that work within the bureaus and um, you know the regulatory state and, and that sort of thing. But they, they don't seem to have any real particular problem with government. Well, it's 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 their outlook on the nature of man. And I think what what most um, people who self-identify as conservatives, thinking they mean small, limited government, um, mistake is that. You know, conservatism to me was defined for the modern, modern era best by Thomas Hobbes. He believed we're so bad and we're so fallen that without this all-powerful government to thwart our every inclination, that we we're just going to kill each other. Or, yeah, well, you know, he says going to be um, chaos. He's the one in Leviathan that says the life of man: solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It's a suggestion. That's him. Yeah. And um, the, the, the thing about it is that, and I think most um, you know, uh, well-read conservatives would say, no, 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 I don't agree with Hobbes. I'm more of a Burkean, Edmund Burke, Russell Kirk, more of a constitutionalist. And there is a difference there in that they think power should be divided. But here's the thing with conservatives. They agree with Hobbes on everything else. They believe that even though the power might be divided between state and federal governments or local governments, that it all resides in the government somewhere. Everything must be regulated. Nothing is left to the individual. And I think this is where people don't understand the conservative mindset is of man of this fallen creature. And uh, that's why, you know, no matter how ridiculous the video might look on some police like brutality case or something like that, they'll always side with the police officer. And it's not just because they love his shiny uh, badge on his uniform. They really think that that's all that stands between us and our, and our dark natures. And um, this is a way of looking at the world. They're not reading out of Edmund Burke's book, but they look at the world the same way that he did and that Thomas Hobbes did. So um, the, what, what you're saying is, is that a conservative, and I'm not trying to rag on conservatives here, I'm happy to rag on liberals too, um, what conservatives do is, is that they essentially, they're operating from fear, and that if it isn't for, uh, you know, the state-run uh, policing agencies or whatever the, um, you know, whatever's out there, then we'd all fall off into darkness anyway, so we have to support them even if they they make mistakes. Tom, but hold that thought. We're going to come back. If you've got time, we'll stick with you here. Tom Mullen, author, is with us. It's Free Talk Live. Tom, Tom Mullen is with us on Skype. And uh, you were just talking, Mark, with Tom about the sort of blind support that conservatives have for the state. Like, right. Uh, go ahead. And yeah, and I'm not trying to rag on conservatives here. I will definitely get to uh, liberals here in a minute. But philosophies come from places, and Tom's trying to point out what those, um, where they come from. But I mean, you sort of have to define it to some extent too. So, um, in dealing with conservatives, oftentimes you'll hear this term thrown around, and I've certainly had it thrown at me: America hater. 
Um, so if you try to point out some mistakes that the uh, that Washington D.C. you know the people in Washington D.C. no matter what time period it is that they made it, um, if you point out a mistake and you don't say um, you don't use the term American exceptionalism before you point out the mistake, you, you hate America is the idea, and it doesn't seem to matter that you can delineate mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake that well you know our government's the best. You know, we, they they make mistakes 47 percent of the time, and the rest of them make uh, mistakes 44 percent of the time. So ours is awesome. Yeah, why don't you shut up, you America hater, Tom? Yeah, you know that comes straight out of Thomas Hobbes. He talks about exactly that over 300 years ago, and says that look at you know the state of nature is so bad, and the government's absolute power is so necessary that even when it does terrible things. It's better to just live under them than to question the sovereign power, because the minute you question it, we're, you're on the way. You're on the way back. There's yeah. going to be a breakdown. It's going to be chaos. And, uh, you know, this is a persistent idea um, that, uh, that you know, better to live under a bad law uh, than, than to even question the law. The law is sacred. The people who enforce it are sacred. They, you know, no matter how terrible yeah. they get, they're all that stand between us and the war of everyone against everyone that would otherwise um, be our, our our fate without government. So and, and this extends to foreign policy as well. And this is this is where I think, you know, it's most striking today. I mean, people clear thinking people ask, why in the world does the most powerful government that's ever existed in the history of man care about what's going on and some destitute little country 7,000 miles away. Well, it's because they see all nations the way they see individuals in society, that they all have to be dominated because any, any kind of um, nation that is not under the dominance of the quote unquote sovereign, in this case, the, the most powerful nation, uh, is a danger, no matter how small yep. and insignificant it might be. And this is really our approach to the world right now. If, if they uh, come on the radar, um, it's a form of rebelliousness. Oh, oh my God! What has Putin said? He's gonna he's gonna kill us all. Russia's got uh, nuclear weapons, or whatever it is that that uh, people say. That's the that's the the mindset. It's the reason that the United States foreign policy, in the form of the State Department, has decided what the immigration policy of uh, Latin American countries is going to look like. Um, it's decided what their um, you know what their uh, central banks are going to do. It's you know deciding basically everything that they do. They let them you know pass a few laws here and there, but. It operates as though Washington, D.C. rules the world. Yeah, and if you go back to the Civil War, the, the whole idea of the domino theory is deeply rooted in Hobbesian or Burkean thinking, really. Um, you know, if, if we let this little tiny country become communist, there's, it's going to just spread all over the world. Of course, that was disproven. I mean, the, the, they did take over, the communists did take over the whole country, and they abandoned communism on their own. So we would you would think that that, we would have learned something from that, but no, um, on and on and on, just keep applying the same ideas. And really the reason I wanted to write the book is for people to recognize them, recognize they've been disproven and separate them from what I believe that most grassroots self-identified conservatives are which are people who want to be libertarian. Yeah. Uh, I think that many people who call themselves conservative are, in fact, libertarian. They just don't know the difference. And this is a point that I will show to, I'll try to point out to conservatives over and over again, is if conservatism is a philosophy, it would be a, a, a staid and permanent philosophy. It is not. You could define it. You can't you, really. You, you can't define conservative. And Nor with liberalism. You liberalism, you can anything. come closer. You can just point out, you know, the planks of the Communist Manifesto and say, look, look they're socialist, <laughs> and you can go from there. But conservatism truly is not a philosophy. Uh, there's there's nothing in it that's philosophical, and I'll, I'll make my point here. My great-grandmother, uh, Pauline Traub, she was a conservative. She pulled down a hickory branch, and she beat the hell out of my great-uncle's uh, for when she found a deck of cards in the house. She beat them bloody with that stick because she was a conservative. Now, how many conservatives today are going to be advocating for beating their kids till they're bloody if they find a deck of cards? 
Well, that's because they're not conservatives, and neither was she. There was, uh, I'm sure her great-grandmother was nuttier than she was um, in, in that respect. Because conservatism it moves along, it, it drags behind the times as far as a timeline goes. Yeah, and you point out something that um, Tom Woods, I, I quote Tom Woods in the book, being frustrated about how now we're defending, quote unquote, conservative New Deal principles and how they just they they vehemently defend Social Security and Medicare when yeah. a few decades ago that they were against it. And it, it goes back to this idea, the established um, tradition, legal tradition, that is, must never be questioned. And back when it was new, of course, they opposed it. Now that it's established, like you said, there's no principle here. It's just that. Well, that does sound it, like a principle. Just, that that yeah. does sound like a principle, right? Anything that is in the past is good, and that which is proposed to change is bad. So that could be it. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you could call it a, a principle. But it's no different than liberalism is today either. If you talk to a conservative, and you, then you go talk to a liberal, and you say, okay, what time period in U.S. history was the best? They will both say the 1950s for different reasons. Mm. The liberals will say unions were very strong, and the uh, the disparity between rich and poor was better, and you know the rest of the world was a smoking slag heap because they'd blown each other to hell, and so therefore the United States was able to uh, you know. Have have stupid socialist policies and, um, you know, still get away with it. More with Tom Mullen here. Uh, the toll-free number, 855-450-3733. And if you have a question for him, he's on with us. Liberals, conservatives, what's it really even mean anyway? we got Tom back so, on the line with us here. Yeah, Tom, um, so what your, your, your thesis here is the United States' revolution, uh, the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, writings, that these are inter uh, these are influenced by Locke and that the U.S. revolution is essentially a libertarian one. Now, obviously, um, you know, at some point or another, the things when I, the, the wheels came off that train, the United States government went from uh, libertarian to something else. And we've we've spent a couple of segments kind of parsing out, uh, you know, conservatism and that kind of thing. Let's talk about liberalism for a second. Where are these people that don't understand economics? Where do they come from? Well, yeah, again, it goes back to, uh, and I think a lot more, more, much more than Marx. I think Marx gives way too much credit. Um, I, I hate this kind of sanctimonious, well, he did make a lot of good points, even though ultimately he was wrong. I think Marx was a hack, and uh, I don't think any of his economic ideas hold any water, even even internally. But um, Yeah, which one? <laughs> um, he, he's really more, just as Burke kind of played off of Hobbes, Marx played off of Rousseau. They all believe one thing. There's something inherently wrong with with private property. It 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 it, it is, um, it it sets up this original sin, if you will. It's antithetical to, to the state. Private property is antithetical to the state. If you can deny something from the grabbing hands of the government, then um, you know, then then you can deny anything to them, and they cannot be denied. Yeah, absolutely. And and where they go with this is is the answer is absolute democracy and an all powerful democracy. Um, you know, the Bill of Rights says even a democratically elected Congress may not pass certain laws. Um, in fact, the, the tradition, the libertarian tradition that starts, I believe, with Locke says the government can't pass most laws. All they can really do is respond to some invasion of a property right. Um, now, of course, Thomas Jefferson and Samuel Adams, they didn't always apply this no. <laughs> perfectly. They, they, could, they, they supported a lot of horrible things, but the ideas were very new back then, and they've been applied better over time. Um, but the, uh, the liberals don't believe this. They, don't, they believe that at one point Rousseau says, well, what would happen if I didn't agree with the majority? He, he says, well, that's how I'd know I was wrong. I mean, <laughs> it's just some great circular logic. Um, and really, that's how they think. And if you listen to uh, American liberal politicians, that's pretty much what they're saying. 
Yeah, gotta, you know, you never, you'll never let a, you hear a liberal say that uh, democracy should be applied on a global scale, right? Like you'll never hear them say, you know, what we need, we need a big, giant, uh, you know, computer program that lets everybody vote on every single issue, and then the majority will decide because you know it'd be Southeast Asia and um, and China that would be uh, making all the decisions for all the rest of us, and uh, you know nobody else would make any decisions. Yeah, and I think we're, what happened in the 20th century, and I, I don't get into this in part one, which is the only part of the book that's out, but part two, you start to get this, this, this jumble of ideas. And where I think the liberal movement went in the 20th century was they took the, the purpose of government from Rousseau, which is to correct inequality in pri from private property, but they took the means to do so from the conservatives, which is an all-powerful, unitary government. Yeah small group of elites with a strong, a central leader as possible. And if you look at Wilson and FDR and LBJ and, and the rest, I mean, that's really what they were, but they had a different purpose. It wasn't to make us all virtuous and squash the evil in us. It was to make us all equal and especially economically equal. Tom, I got uh, Doug on the line in Illinois with a question for you. Doug, you're on with Tom Mullen. Yeah, I pretty much wanted to bring up and find out from Tom if, uh, you know, in your opinion, do we do you feel that we have the government infringing upon private property more and more? Um, to give you an idea, I know of two people who bought a home up in Chicago a while while ago. Um, they were going to put an addition on it. They were going to remodel it. And a bunch of people in the neighborhood got word of it, and they didn't like it, and they went and they tried to effectively get the Landmark Commission to approve an overlay on the home. They did get it done. The two people who bought the home had nothing in it. Uh, keep in mind, they bought the home. They owned the home, but they had nothing involved in putting the Landmark Commission overlay on it. Now they have to jump through any type, every type of hoop imaginable to try and get anything done. They effectively don't own the home. They have to get permission for whatever they do. I mean, uh, you know, if you want to put down a uh, re-roof the home, now you got to get approval to ensure it will be the proper type of shingle. You know, I mean, I think that what we're moving toward here can be we're moving toward the collective and not the individual. We're, we're moving more toward mob rule. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'd have to agree. And uh, I mean, private property, and I think as either Mark or Ian said before, is the complete opposite of the state. Uh, it's been under assault for all of the past century, maybe more. Um, Think about property taxes. I mean, you really rent your home. If you don't pay, they kick you out and they take it away. Um, but and, and the other thing that comes to mind, along with what you're talking about, um, as far as, as um, zoning or, or, or other kinds of um, permitting for, for what you can do on your own property, is also what happened with the Civil Rights Act, where suddenly some private property becomes a public accommodation. That's a creepy word. Uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act had a great uh, intention, but Titles Two and Seven mm -hmm. pretty much eliminated the idea that any kind of a business is a private property. So, yeah, that, that distinction seems to be er eroded more and more and more. I, I absolutely agree with you. And that is the central uh, issue that we should be facing, because really, you don't have any rights that aren't tied to some kind of private property. Right. And we are discussing. I'm mean, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Doug. I found that to be incredible. That had been a turning point in my life when that happened, for the fact that it, it turned from being, okay, you have to go to the government to get a permit to ensure that you're having the work done properly to ensure nobody will get hurt, to, okay, you now have to get approval from a board to ensure that you're doing what the community would like the way your home to look. You no longer buy a home, okay, to make it your own. You, you are, like, renting it, and you're doing it. You're living to benefit other people. Well, you know what? The hell with that, man. They're not paying the mortgage. They're not paying to upkeep the home. Why should they be involved in it? Not only that, you know, they I, can come into your home any damn time they want to. I mean, if you look at uh, what happened after the Boston bombing in Watertown, Massachusetts, where you have men with guns who were literally entering every single home, uh, you know, and, and there were libertarians down there at the time that we know knew personally who were too afraid— of these men with the guns to actually stand up for themselves and tr to even try to say, no, you can't come in here. So, you know, and then you've, you've got that happening here. And then, of course, over in France, now they've got this emergency powers that is allowing them to arrest 
and uh, put uh, activists on house arrest and then go in and raid those people's homes preemptively, basically. So now there's a news story today about how the federal government is rethinking its homeland security policy. So, you know, look for more uh, invasions of your privacy coming very, very soon. Doug, thanks for your call here tonight. And Tom Mullen, uh, it's Where Do Conservatives and Liberals Come From? That's the book. Amazon is, of course, a place to go and get it. Thanks for coming on Free Talk Live tonight. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Appreciate Always it, a man. pleasure. Yep, that's TomMullen.net. That's his website, by the way. Uh, and we'll come back with more Free Talk Live. You can join us here on the air. 